Welcome here. Can you hear me on the mic? Although I don't know whether it's necessary, but um, uh, for those of us, myself included, who were struggling with uh, the uh, lower and the higher sounds, uh, it might be useful. Uh, my name is Fani Kruger. I am attached here at UJ to the Department of Public Management and Governance. Um, and I have been asked to facilitate the discussion of the uh, topic and the book and the theme that we uh, will be doing tonight. Uh, our time frames are that uh, we would have to end the event around about quarter past seven, well hopefully the latest by quarter past seven, um, and I will therefore uh, have the discussion continuing until about this after seven o'clock. And uh, then we leave a few minutes' time for, uh, for conclusion. Now, I hope that all of you so far have had something to drink and to eat, some refreshments, and that you're uh, ready to interact very actively and vocally with uh, our guest speaker tonight. As you know, this is a regular event that is presented by the uh, University Library in. Uh, partnership with a number of academic departments and we are honored tonight to have as our guest speaker Dr. Franz Cornier. Uh, he is the CEO of the South African Institute of Race Relations, which is not very far from UJ, it's just on the other side of the country club. Uh, the Institute of Race Relations has a very long history in this country of a research organization that uh, publishes extremely valuable research results, data, commentaries, proposals for improvement in our society. Um, Dr. Cronier just uh, showed me their latest report. This is the latest 2013 report on the survey of South Africa. It's a Mandela commemorative edition. Uh, you will probably find statistics and data and commentaries on anything you need to know about. What's not in here, I don't think is very relevant <laughs> for the future. But you can test that. You can test that by, by at some stage getting hold of the literature. I'm sure it's available in the library here and uh, also available at the Institute. Um, now, <coughs> We decided to ask Dr. Cornier to come and tell us something about his latest uh, book. This is it. Uh, our next 10 years, a time traveler's guide to the next 10 years. This is a popularized version and a summary of his doctoral thesis on this topic. And um, as is the case normally, the university and its partners decide on on what they regard as a very topical and interesting publication, and then get someone to engage Professor um, Cornier and oh, Dr. Cornier and, and uh, other authors on the topic. Uh, so the way we're going to do that tonight is I'm going to provide him an opportunity for about 20 minutes or so just to summarize for us the things that he regards as important for purposes of our discussion. And then um, after those 20 minutes, we're going to, we're going to uh, uh, engage him in, in discussions. I will ask some leading questions, trying to play devil's advocate. Uh, and I'm going to have an interactive session with you and provide you also with opportunities to engage him, either by asking questions, by asking him to clarify some issues, or by making your own comments. Because this is not a one-way street of communication. We would like to have your views in the form of comments or your own opinions on what you regard as, as important. And tell him where you think he's wrong, tell him where you think he's right, and tell him where, tell him where you think he can improve things. That's what we like as part of the critical discourse that we present at UJ. Therefore, thank you very much for your presence. And uh, uh, Franz, I'm going to give over immediately to you for your introduction. Fani, thank you. Good evening. Very nice to be with you this evening. I'm going to try and make this as easy as possible for your cameraman by standing as still as possible. Uh, we'll see if he can keep up with me. 
<laughs> the institute that I work for is a think tank. The uh, university here is actually a client of our consulting division, the Center for Risk Analysis. So all the data and reports and so on that I talk about, that you may hear about, are available through, um, through the university to you. The time traveler scenarios were published about four months ago, three months ago. There was a six month roadshow before that when we showed them to leading audiences in uh, business and in government. And they come from a very practical place. Client demand through our consulting division. Our clients are typically foreign governments, big corporates, uh, banks, and increasingly government departments. To tell them where South Africa is headed, why it's headed there, and when we get there, what's it going to be like. And in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to try and give you a very clear description of South Africa as it will look the morning that we wake up after our 2024 election. So I've got two minutes per year to cover, so I'm necessarily jumping. The strategy session on this would be three or four hours, so if I leave out some critical bits, you will forgive me. How do we make, what's the argument? The stepping stones on the way to that argument. That's January of 1990, uh, 1994. That is December of 2013. It's the whole democratic era. What we're measuring off the left-hand axis, a wonderful piece of information called the Reserve Bank's lead indicator. This is an index weighted to 100 in 2010 that the bank puts together indicative of future economic performance. If the index is climbing, it suggests that the economy will see an upward trajectory. If the index starts to decline, it's a warning that economic circumstances may turn around. Superimpose off the right-hand axis levels of economic growth on top of the index, and it works perfectly. This climb, that economic boost, the turnaround here, the decline in the middle. This long period, this is about 1998, climbing all the way into the end of 2007, builds into this little mini growth boom when South Africa grows at, on average, about 5% of GDP for four years, the only time it does it after 1994. The trouble, though, is in the tail. Growth settling into a rut of between 2 and 3% of GDP, while the index is starting to level out, meaning that if the history is anything to go by, we're not going to climb out of that growth rut. Point one on the way to the scenarios. Point two, our Achilles heel, the participation of people in our economy measured here in terms of labor market participation. Today, just less than 10 million black South Africans have a job in the broadest definition of work, formal sector, informal sector, selling oranges on the side of the road, it's all in there. About 7 million are unemployed in the sense that they are either looking for work or available for work or would work if a job was offered to them. White South Africa, two million work, about one and a half, about 150,000 are in this, this definition of what it is to be unemployed. Unemployment, very complex subject, lots of different definitions, all take in different directions. The difficulty, the trouble we face is here. For every 100 off the right-hand axis now, black South Africans who work, 70 are looking for a job or would work or should be working if a job was available. The ratio for white South Africa is 7 to 1. To bring 7 to 100, to bring the black ratio down to the white ratio, let's say within a decade, would require we estimating, estimate doubling the number of black South Africans with a job within 10 years. It's a very ambitious ask. Step 3, what makes us such a unique emerging market, the model of development that we run on? 1994 to 2012, 0 to 18 million people. These are people with jobs. 8 million out to 14 million. So the argument that we've had 20 years of jobless growth doesn't work. But you will notice that a lot of that job growth slows within the first decade post-1994. Subsequently, take 2001 now to 2012, 2013 looks the same. We go through an era of virtually zero net new job growth. On top of that data now, put in people receiving welfare grants. In 94, there are 2 million people receiving grants, 8 million working, so 4 people working for every grant recipient. There you can see a policy change. Cabinet has, has had a decision. We're going to go for welfare. Within the next 15 years, the number of grant beneficiaries take off 
they exceed the number of people in employment for the first time in 2010 and that gap continues to open. Now, you must believe me on this, I can show you the data, you can ask me for it, we'll send it to you. About half a million South Africans pay two-thirds of income tax. They're the same people that run the companies that pay all corporate tax and therefore generate the economic activity that makes all VAT receipts possible. So you can get away with a rough, rough estimate. Half a million South Africans make 15 million welfare grants possible in addition to funding a great majority of government revenue. Next step in the puzzle. Curiously for all of this, it's wrong to suggest that South Africa doesn't have much to show in terms of socio-economic improvement over the past 20 years. The numbers on the bottom of this graphic run from 1 to 10. They relate to what we call LSM indicators. LSMs are living standard measures that determine your standard of living based on whether you have a cell phone or a vacuum cleaner or a washing machine, something like that. LSM 1, the bottom of the spectrum, the lowest standard of living. LSM 10, the highest, 0 to 7 million people. That is the whole South African population of 2001 the majority of people in the lower half of the spectrum. Fast forward a decade into the future and we've been through a revolution. Five million people have left the lowest three living standards categories. They've moved into mid-level categories and people moving from mid-level categories into higher categories. The better life for all, that very effective ANC slogan, certainly on this measure and many others that we use. The data says that we've done better than we realise. Now it's a curious thing, because there seems to be a contradiction. Because I've told you that between these same years, 2001 to 12, we have virtually zero net new job creation, and yet living standards are taking off. Much of the explanation lies in this indicator again, SWR, social welfare recipients. There are three million of them when I start this analysis. By the time I conclude it, we have become the developing world's biggest welfare state and the effect on living standards is there to measure everything from child malnutrition levels to this to whatever you want to see. We can see what welfare has done, all the way to looking at the bottom lines of SABs and shop right checkers and so on that picked up on a lot of this welfare spend. The next piece of the puzzle, part of, I'd say, perhaps the primary policy obstacle that confronts the government, the changing structure of our GDP. I start for you in 1950, we're very keen at the IRR on the long view, we think it's very valuable. I've shown you the benchmark year of 1976, the transition year of 94, 2014. I've shown you some economic sectors. Agriculture's contribution to the economy, 15% in the 50s, about 3% today. Mining's contribution, spikes on the gold price of the early 1980s, the overall trend is downwards, the recovery is an illusion. It's the weakening RAND increasing the earnings of mining companies, not a recovery of the mining sector itself. The really dangerous one is this. Our manufacturing sector's contribution to the economy. 20 to 25 percent of GDP from the 50s on the 1990s, it starts to turn and sliding downwards. We need to get back. I've skipped things, retail, construction, various other bits and pieces. But one sector has been growing very quickly, really in the last 20 years, you can track that growth back really into the 1950s. That's our high-tech, high-skilled services sectors. The proxy for that here, banking, finance and insurance, 9% of the economy on its way to 25. The trouble is that this is a post-industrial economy existing within an emerging market. We have also not, if these slides are in the right order, which they are, been able to develop the skills <coughs> base to take advantage of what is actually a unique strength our services economy within Africa. Here's the whole education system. Zero to 1.4 million school pupils. We're going to take them through their whole school careers, preschool out to matric. We're then going to send them to university and see what happens to them. Grade R preschool, about 800,000 kids on average in recent years. Every grade of the school system out to grade 10, we average about a million pupils. It's the right number because it's the age cohort that should be in school. Then the problem. 
between 10 and 11 on average, about 200,000 are dropping out of the school system, and a further 300,000 will drop out between 11 and 12. Only half the kids that sat in grade one on current trends are ever going to have the experience of sitting in a matric class. 380,000 pass, university entrance pass, sitting at about 170, 180,000. Considering the increasingly high-tech, high-skilled, tertiary nature of our economy, this is a problem. 40,000 are passing maths with 50% in matric. First year enrolment higher than the university pass rate. This is broader enrolment in all post-school education. Everyone graduated with something. Degrees about 80,000. Business, law, medicine and engineering degrees 30,000. A number that hinges on the 40,000 passing maths with 50% in matric. For that reason we can't put great majority of people in a position to take advantage of South Africa's natural economic strength. There are hard future constraints on growth. Come across these things like concrete ceilings on what an economy can do until you break through that ceiling. Electricity supply is one of them. Zero to 80,000 megawatts. This is the whole generating capacity of the South African electrical grid. We currently here at about 42,000 megawatts. On the new delayed timetables for the, for the uh, Madupi Kusilia and the Ngula pump station, we should be close to 52,000 megawatts by 2020. The problem, the moving average of economic growth for the last 20 years is 3%. In that environment, demand for electricity has been increasing at 4% per annum. Put the demand line in. That's where we sit today. Supply just on top of demand and the fact that we've been through some tough economic quarters is the reason that the lights have stayed on. But if we get onto a 3% GDP growth track with this pace of electricity delivery, demand will exceed supply. Hit the National Development Plan's GDP growth target of 5.4%, assuming 6% demand growth for electricity, we're never in the game at all. In fact, on that, our, on that assessment, we need to add the equivalent of Madupi and Kusile to the grid every five years for the next 20 years. Opinion poll data done for the President's office, the best polling data I think that there is. Sarah Palin, who would have made a fantastic American <laughs> Vice President, was after the American journalist Katie Curtis had, had, had revealed that Palin knows nothing about anything. And, and she was diving in the American opinion polls. Uh, a journalist said to her, you know, Ms. Palin, what do you make of your collapse in the polls? And she said, polls are for strippers and skiing. <laughs> <laughs> they can be useful insights to use to read against hard social and economic data. Done for the President's office. Do you believe the government performs well? The peak year, 80% of South Africans saying yes in 2004 as we enter that growth boom. Government popularity has fallen 30 percentage points. Are you happy with service delivery? Straight downwards. Doesn't contradict my point of increasing living standards. I get around that problem by developing what we call the theory of the crisis of rising expectations. Very important in the scenarios that follow. The more you improve people's standards of living, the faster they have expectations of continued improvements. If you do not lay the groundwork of education and job creation to meet those expectations, it doesn't help to tell those people it's better today than it was 20 years ago. You'll be in as much political trouble as if you'd never built an RDP house in the first place. And we, we find in our interactions with government increasing buy-in to that message. Do you believe that we are moving in a, can you be confident of a happy future sentiment on South Africa turning downwards? We see a trend, I don't show it to you, of a major tailing off in voter participation in South Africa. In fact, in this most recent election, 36% of South Africans over the age of 18 voted for the ANC, but 41% of those South Africans, that age group, didn't vote at all. So the non-voter, the person who doesn't vote, is now, in terms of numbers, a bigger political constituency than ANC supporters. That trend coincides with this 2004 to 2013, zero to 2000 incidents, it's the police's database of their public order units deployments to fight violent protest action. 2,000 incidents off a base of 1,000 a decade before, four, five, six incidents of violent anti-government protest every day. 
a small study, a major study, in fact, uh, a very good one, we think, done of major, what they euphemistically call service delivery protests, picked up 10 such protests in 2004 on its way to 100 by 2012-2013. Strike action, 0 to 16 million man days lost, let's say there are 50 of us here, we all strike. Tomorrow we will be 50 man days lost to the economy for this year. On average, between 94 and 2006, South Africa lost 2 million man days a year to strike action. Get into 27 and we're in a totally different labour world. Those are the figures. They're years. They run in cycles and wage negotiation cycles when we're losing five, six, seven times the average of before. Where does all of this leave us? Living standards are taking off. Of that, there must be no doubt. Delivery of services, welfare, has done a great deal more to improve the basic living standards of poor people than is often acknowledged. Levels of economic growth are, however, too low to draw the levels of investment, firstly, for the growth, to draw the jobs, to meet the expectations that are being created within those large groups of mainly young people. The result, the opinion polls diving, the protest action taking off. The question the scenario is sought to answer is what happens next. The way we do that and the method is something that I think will come out in the discussion. What are the government's options? One major option runs on this axis, it's policy reform. Do we see extensive macroeconomic policy reform over the next decade and within 10 years we're growing much faster, creating many more jobs? Do we see a rejection of policy reform? Second major alternative open to the government, do we remain to the society? Do we remain the free and open political system that we are today? Or does a desperate government, fearing it's losing power, start to tamper with constitutional safeguards in a drive to rule with impunity, we become a closed patronage-driven political system. How those trends combine reveal the scenarios. The wide road, we are wealthier, we are free. The, no the rocky road, we become poorer. And before we know what's happened, uh, there's a government that can rule with impunity, no one can do anything about it. The one on the road show that the South African government was very drawn to is the narrow road. We become less democratic, allowing the state to hammer trade unions, for example, use political power to place the private sector in a position to drive much higher levels of growth. An example might be that of the Chinese economy of today's centrally directed political system allowing a rampant market economy to play itself out. South Korea of the 1970s, another example. And finally, the toll road scenario. Unpopular, counterproductive policy decisions and we remain free. What happens in each scenario? And then I close for you and we can start discussing this. The economic futures, 94 to the scenario horizon, the morning after the 2024 election, we argued in the wide road scenario and in the narrow road that the following outcome is feasible. Coming out of the 2014 election, we wrote, the government goes through a period of serious introspection and realises it has to reform itself, its policies and its behaviour to draw the investment, to drive the growth, to create the jobs, to save itself. The reform process plays itself out we end the decade at 5% growth. In the wide road scenario, we've remained free and open society. So the government had to convince South Africans to back the reform process. In the narrow road scenario, the government felt it could never convince South Africans to back what would be seen as a very conservative reform process. So they destroyed democratic institutions, stood on the toes of trade unions, uh, restricted the activities of difficult civil society groups, impinged on the independence of the judiciary to force unpopular reform. Either way, we get to 5% growth, the unemployment rate. At that growth trajectory, we expect to end the decade at around 15%. The Rocky Road scenario, that's the economic result. We argued what will happen here is coming out of the 2014 election, the government rejects the need to change. And Kandla is, is not a problem. The policy and framework within the country would work if only the uh, international economic environment would change. No change happens. We grow at 2, 2.5% two into 2019. The ANC sheds its best leaders. In the book we actually write in this scenario, Manuel walks out ahead of the 2019 election. 
bereft of its best leaders, the trends, the protests, the violence, the opinion polls turning against the ANC, it turns hard left, we end the decade in negative growth. Unemployment rate, 35%. Finally, the toll road scenario, we said nothing would change. The emerging from the 2014 election, the government would seem to be at odds with itself. Its diagnosis of the danger to itself and very high levels of unemployment would be a very good and, and public and cabinet ministers would talk of a ticking time bomb. At the same time, its actions wouldn't reflect its own diagnosis and its commentary, it would stand still. Growth, 2.5% for 10 years, unemployment rate flat. The political consequences, the wide road, Governments convinced, led by the ANC, South Africans, to follow an economic reform process. We're growing at 5% by 2024. Unemployment is down to 15%. The ANC's political performance, all elections since 1994. The peak, 69% in 2004. We said they'd hit 63 in 2014, and we got that one spot on. We said they'll bottom out at about 60% in 2019. And as the effects of reform are felt, as growth happens, job creation takes off, more entrepreneurship, better governance, better service delivery, the ANC will bounce into the low 60s, govern South Africa successfully for some time to come. The ANC's bounce will cut off any prospect that the DA could govern a future South Africa. Its growth cut off by the ANC's recovery. By that stage, we think of a coalition party of sorts, the radical left, the RLs, I uh, did very well in 2014, continue to grow, the, but the government doesn't need them, the opposition doesn't need them, they're colourful, they're loud, but they're a sideshow. In the narrow road scenario, forced reform, very unpopular reform process, the ANC's political performance, we think the dive will be steeper into 2019 because the effects of reform are yet to be felt in households, and it appears as if the government's acting with growing impunity, disregard for human rights and the like. Lots of analysts at this point write the ANC's obituary. But as the economy recovers, as the jobs are created, the ANC will bounce. To go along with that scenario, you need to go along with just one assumption, that South Africans will trade a degree of liberty for the prosperity and the stability they think that prosperity will bring them. The DA has continued to grow, led by, it is by this stage a young, black-led political movement made up of aspirant, born-free, middle-class voters aren't prepared to make that deal. The radical left did very well as the ANC started to dive, but the economic recovery takes the wind out of the radical sails and it sinks them back to 10%. The Rocky Road scenario, the ANC refuses to reform. It behaves in an increasingly undemocratic manner, especially after the setback of hitting the high 50s in the 2019 election. Only because it's destroying democratic institutions has it not suffered a landslide defeat in 2024. The DA has grown, that same black-led new party, but not enough to beat the ANC outright. The radical left are making inroads, but not enough. Put the ANC at 49% in that election and the world changes again. South Africa is now in the era of coalition politics. The ANC needs a partner with which to establish a government. And who's that going to be and where will that take them? Or do this lot get together to keep them out? Finally, the toll road scenario. The ANC does nothing. It's confused. It talks reform but doesn't do any reform. Talks about corruption, doesn't do anything about corruption talks about police brutality, but we will have another Americana within, within this decade, if, if not more than one. The result is between 19 and 24, it suffers a landslide defeat. Landslide defeat sees the DA win an outright majority. The amazing sight of a young DA leader being inaugurated in front of the union buildings when Nelson Mandela stood 30 years before. The radical left aren't getting anywhere because this young DA-led party is very good at drawing desperate young people away from the radical alternative. The reason we had to engineer those outcomes, the declining left and the ANC's landslide defeat, is that there's no other way we could engineer an outright opposition victory within the next 10 years. When we were doing the road show on this and talking to audiences before, a lot of people, I mean, a, a mining client, uh, uh, not nearly as polite as you are, and would laugh at these things and say the ANC can never lose. 
But the evidence came in the 2014 election in the ANC's Gauteng performance, 70%, 63%, and the wake-up call, 53%. That break can come for the ANC. We don't think there's a, fourth scenario, a fifth scenario. South Africa's future, to a lesser or greater extent, will fall within the broad framework of what we suggest here. Read the indicators. Nothing should happen that takes you by surprise. And uh, Professor Kluter, I think, is now going to interrogate me on on how this could all be. The book is here at the back. It's also at exclusive books. Uh, I think we, they hear it around uh, 200 rand a copy exactly. Thank you. Thank you.
and teach our students also, there seems to be an instrument that can help us to prepare ourselves for the complexities that we might face in the future, for these possible different futures? Yeah. Or, 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 or is, it, is it pie in the sky mm. to, to have a nice intellectual discussion here and then go back just, just to face the reality around us? Yeah. Well, the, the very interesting question on scenarios is, are they actually about the future? And I think the best answer is that they're not. <coughs> they're about the present. Scenarios are there to allow you to test your present decisions to see what will happen if you do the following. The uh, globally well-known, uh, renowned scenario planner Jill Ringland says that scenarios are wind tunnels to the future. They allow you to take your policy framework that you're now going to adopt newly, put them in that wind tunnel and say, if we do this, what may happen? Good scenarios aren't an exercise that will get people to wait to see whether they were correct before changing their behavior. Really good scenarios get you to change your behavior today in order to realize the best case scenario and avoid the worst case scenario. About three years ago, we at the IRR produced a scenario of the ANC losing an election in South Africa. At the time, a mad idea. Could it ever happen? Zuma will rule until Jesus comes. Judas Malema, very cleverly walking in the streets of Cape Town, said he hasn't seen Jesus yet, so he doesn't know if, if Zuma is correct. Um, and a senior opposition politician said to us, what's so interesting about what you've done is that have you created a self-fulfilling prophecy? If you can't think that something's possible, can it be realized? But do good scenarios become self-fulfilling in that more and more people align their behavior to realize the better case and avoid the worst case? So scenarios, scenario planning is, I think, a, a new, it, it's been around for a while. It emerged in, in military planning in the aftermath of the Cold War. It shot to global fame in the 1970s when Shell used it to anticipate the 1973, I think, global oil price spike taught at business schools around the world. But it's still a new discipline. And one of the great questions about it is, is its utility more in the present than in the future, whereas a forecast utility resides entirely in the future? If the forecast is wrong, let's say we say the ANC is going to lose, and that forecast is wrong, then what do we do? But with a scenario world, you have the alternative. One of the very good quotes on that is that scenarios don't, allow, don't ensure that you will be right about the future. They ensure that you will not be wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, so far. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen. Uh,